Who is Jesus? See, we've been journeying together through some of these key statements, all in the Gospel of John, about who is Jesus? Who does he say that he is? And there's this consistent theme of Jesus' identity as he teaches to further unveil and reveal and declare who he is. You see, Jesus' goal is for people to grasp and believe that he truly is the Son of God, that he truly is the Savior and the Messiah that God promised thousands of years before. The problem was the people, especially the Jews, the, the religious people, God's people, had a hard time seeing beyond all of their religious traditions, all of their religious rituals and systems, their way of doing church, to see and experience the fresh new way of who Jesus is. Now, Jesus worked very hard, and he was an excellent master teacher, teaching on the spot, using what was available to him, and using symbols, practical symbols, practical concepts to redefine them spiritually and and redefine them for the people to understand who he is and what he's about. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. We've we've seen those in the last couple of weeks. And today we're going to see that He is the gate, the gate for the sheep. So after declaring himself the light of the world in John chapter 8, we looked at that last week, you you move to John chapter 9 and you see Jesus practicing what he preaches, living it out. He comes across a blind man and he gives him sight, gives him light and declares to him that, that he is the light. And as long as Jesus says, as long as I am the light, I'm going to continue to be what God's called me to be. But see, the problem was, it happened on the Sabbath. It happened on the Jewish day of rest. And there were very strict rules. There were very strict guidelines and regulations and expectations, and some of them set forth by God in the Old Testament through the commandments and through the truths of Scripture that He had given them. But many of them were at the hands of the Jews and religious leaders themselves, because they had added all of these man-made rules and expectations of you can't do any work and you can't walk very far and you can only eat certain foods and you have to observe the the ceremonial washing of hands and all of these things. And so this this miraculous, life-changing event for this man who was blind and could now see, instead of being rejoiced and celebrated with, was criticized, was questioned, he was ridiculed. Talk about sucking all of the joy and all the life out of the miraculous work of Jesus. The Pharisees. The strict religious fundamentalists could pretty much suck the joy out of anything that Jesus was trying to do. They were distracted and discouraged and they didn't understand and they disagreed with the fact that he broke the rules and broke the laws and met the need, a life-changing need. Of a man, but because it happened on the Sabbath, because it happened on Sunday, they disagreed with it. <clears throat> they challenged Jesus, they opposed Jesus, that they questioned this man, trying to get him to, to, to admit that, that it was wrong and that it wasn't right and it wasn't appropriate for this to happen when it did, and he refused to do so, and they were dissatisfied that all he could say was, I, I don't know, but, but I once was blind and now I can see. And my life's been changed, and I don't really care about these religious rules and regulations you put in place. This man changed my life. And they kicked him out. They excommunicated him. They revoked his membership as being a part of them. So Jesus rebukes them for being spiritually blind. And then we come to chapter 10 to this part of the story. And it begins in verse 1. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, the scripture says, Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, 
but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought all of his own outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they'll run away from them because they don't know the voice of strangers. Now, Jesus was speaking here. He gave them this figure of speech, but they didn't understand, verse 6, what he was telling them. So in verse 7, Jesus said again, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy. But I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So Jesus makes this declaration here and John chapter 10, I am the gate. <clears throat> now, in the next few verses, if you keep reading through John chapter 10, he very boldly proclaims that I am the good shepherd. We get two I am statements all packaged into one here. And everything fits in this shepherd imagery. Jesus uh, being the good shepherd, we're going to explore that next week. But this whole passage fits under the theme of Jesus being the good shepherd. He uses his shepherd theme and he uses the the illustration and the truth of of a shepherd. And Jesus uses the shepherd imagery, this role of the shepherd, because that was prominent in their culture. They they, they lived in the the Middle Eastern desert and shepherding was was prominent, was significant. Everybody either knew shepherds or knew of the shepherds or uh, uh, many of them were shepherds. And when we read passages of Scripture like this, it's somewhat strange for us. I mean, Jesus is talking in this weird language, and um, it, this, this, this whole idea, I don't know about you, but I've never truly met a shepherd. I've never been or lived in the, the Middle East or seen a, a true shepherd, shepherding sheep. Uh, maybe you have. Uh, but some of these teachings and concepts that Jesus talks about are foreign to us. We don't understand them in many ways. But Jesus was excellent. Jesus was amazing at using highly relevant terms in his preaching and teaching that the people he was preaching to and teaching to could clearly understand, could clearly relate with, and they really had no excuse for not understanding what Jesus was saying. You see, if Jesus were teaching here in the context of athletes, He would be using images and and stories and examples from sports. And he would be using prominent athletic symbols. If Jesus was teaching uh, uh, over here at the stockyards in Fort Worth, he'd be using symbols and phrases and examples that the ranchers would understand. And here Jesus is talking about shepherding and sheep because the people that he was teaching to were fully immersed in that culture and they completely understood the concept of shepherding the sheep. You see, Jesus was able to cut to the heart of the current culture and the climate of his day with with great relevance. And I think we miss that sometimes. I mean, we're a couple of thousand years and halfway around the world disconnected from what the context that Jesus is teaching in. And you hear me say that all the time. Context matters, context matters, context matters. You know, there's a lot of things I didn't learn in college. There's a lot of things I didn't learn in seminary. There's a lot of things I've already forgotten that I've learned in college. A lot of things I've already forgotten that that I learned in seminary. But I I learned real quick that if I'm going to understand and connect with God's Word, I've got to understand the context. I've got to understand the culture. And Jesus was excellent. At cutting to the heart of the culture. At being culturally relevant. And we should do the same thing here in our culture. We should be the same way as Christians and as a church. 
Understanding who we're trying to reach, who it is that God's given us to reach with the gospel and seek to connect with them with relevance and with clarity. Jesus is, is teaching and preaching about shepherds because that was relevant and clear to the culture that he was teaching in. <clears throat> and as we seek to help people find and follow Jesus, we've got to be relevant to the culture. We've got to know who it is we're trying to reach and we've got to be able to connect with them and we've got to be able to understand them. We've got to be able to speak their language in the context of the gospel so that we can connect with them and impact them and see their lives changed as well. But the religious leaders, uh, the, the, the shepherds that Jesus talks about here, served to represent God. They served to, to demonstrate God's love for the people. They were the called leaders. The religious leaders were the ones who were set apart by God to take care of and care for the people, but they weren't caring for them very well. And many of the religious leaders were, were leading people away from God. Instead of to God. Instead of leading them to a, to a fulfilling, significant relationship with Jesus, they were just leading them into empty rituals and routines. And overbearing them with rules and regulations. They were weighed down and, and burdened by the legalism and the man-made rules of the quote-unquote church people in the first century. And this works-based, judgmental approach was joyless. It, it was unfulfilling. It, it didn't satisfy their souls, as we sang about a moment ago. You see, Jesus came to proclaim himself as God in the flesh. The promised one who would rescue us from sin. Who would give us direct relationship with God. And he's doing everything he can to help the people get it. He, t he took bread and said, I'm the, I'm the bread of life, and, and related that to their lives, and they didn't get it. He said, I I'm, I'm the light of the world, and in this amazing light ceremony, and this prominent theme that was a part of their culture. I mean, he was digging deep into the heart of the, the symbolism of their religious understanding, and transforming it, and redefining it, just hoping that they would find satisfaction in the person of Jesus. That the fountain of God's love and God's grace would pour over them in abundance. And they would see and hear and know and understand. And the light bulb would go off. It would click. The puzzle pieces would go together. And that their lives could be changed by the power of the gospel. Not by an empty religious system. And all of these other leaders, many of them inside the church and some of them outside of the church can't give relational access to God like Jesus can. He goes, listen, many people have come before me. And he's not talking about necessarily about Moses and Abraham and the pillars of the faith. Many of them were good and great and pointed people to God. But these Jews, these, these religious leaders that are, that are causing all kinds of problems, they can't even rejoice when a man goes from being blind and being able to see, and he's just so full of joy, and they tried to suck all the life out of it. And they kicked him out and told him he didn't have a place there because they didn't, he didn't fit into their mold, into their structure, into their set of expectations. So Jesus expounds on all the ways that his role as the good shepherd supersedes all the other shepherds, all the other leaders. But in the midst of that, he says, I am the gate. I am the gate for the sheep. What does that mean? What point is Jesus trying to make with this statement? I am the gate for the sheep. What he's saying is that Jesus protects us from the destruction of sin. And Jesus provides us overcoming joy in this life. That's what he was trying to get them to see. That's what we need to see in our lives. That Jesus protects us from the destruction of sin. And Jesus provides us overcoming joy in this life. Life's tough. Life's hard. Life's messy. But the joy of Jesus and the presence of Jesus and the provision of Jesus and the protection of Jesus can help us live with overcoming joy if we will put our faith in him. No one, no thing can get you and I access to God, to, get, to God's protection, to God's provision apart from Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and he said, I am the gate. I am the gate of the sheep. Salvation is only through faith in Jesus Christ. 
and a satisfying life on earth is a life lived in faith for Jesus Christ. Jesus is the gate. He, he's the entry point. He's the access point to God. Think about it for a minute. Think about even in our lives. I mean, we're not shepherds and we're not living in the first century. Uh, and I'll explain that more fully in a minute to help you understand what they were trying to understand. But think about a gate for a minute. Think about the person. Uh, your translation may say door. It may say gate. It may say door. Think about the, the purpose and the role of a gate. The purpose and role of a door for just a moment. It's, it's an entry point. It's an access point. It gives you access to the place. The door, the, the door to your home. If it, was just all, if it was just all walls, you'd have no way to get in. Or if you sat inside of it while they built it and built it all the way around, then you'd have no way to get out. Think about a door. Think about a gate. Just the, the simplicity of that. It provides access. It's an entry point. But a gate or a door can also have a lock on it in order to keep people out. So a gate can let people in and a gate can be locked and keep people out. And you can put a chain on the gate and then they can cut off the chain on the gate and still break into the storage shed, which has happened twice in the last month, by the way. And that's an example of what, what Jesus is saying. He says, I am the gate. I am the means of protection, of keeping the bad things out, and I am the means of provision, of letting in and leading you to where the good things are. I am the gate. I am the gate of the sheep, Jesus says. And when our faith is in Jesus, he protects us. He protects us and he provides for us. And first, he protects us from those that are trying to get into our lives and the, and, and the sin and the things and the temptations of this world that are trying to harm us and that are trying to destroy us. False teaching, works-based salvation, pagan religion, many times ourselves. And when our faith is in Jesus... He not only protects us, but he also provides for us. He provides for us a place, a place to be nurtured, a place to be loved, a place to be provided for. Now let's talk about shepherding in the Middle East for a minute, so maybe we can better understand what Jesus is saying. Shepherding in the Middle Eastern desert was difficult. It was dry, it was barren, it was a rocky, rough, rough rocky terrain. There were often cliffs and uh, it, it wasn't just this, you know, we see this picture of these beautiful sheep and this guy in his little outfit and his little crooked sh st staff standing there, and it's all great. I wish pastoring looked a lot like that too, by the way. But it was an ugly, dirty, hard, messy job that, that most people weren't really grateful for. But it was necessary. The terrain was desolate. The predators were dangerous. And so nighttime would come and the shepherd would need to protect the sheep naturally, right? Well, you can't watch them all and protect them all if they're just out in an open field. And so they had uh, these walls built, these places, these yards, I guess you could say, where they would herd the sheep into at night. And often multiple shepherds would, would herd multiple herds of sheep into some of the same sheep pens. And it was basically a stone wall. Uh, circular shape, square shape, rectangle shape, you know, hexagonal shape. We're not really sure. It could be a, a, all the above. And so basically it was a stone wall enclosure all the way around. And there was one small opening, one place, and that was the gate. And that, now that you, had, you had brushy, thorny vines and stuff growing on top of the walls, which, you know, to try to keep people from, from climbing in because people would come in and try to steal sheep because... You know, they could sell them, they could eat them, and uh, they, they wanted them uh, on their own, or, or, or wolves and wild animals, and others would come in and try to, try to find dinner or uh, early breakfast. But the shepherd would man the gate, or sometimes a, a hired hand, a gatekeeper, would man the gate. And so you've got the wall and, and the vines that's supposed to protect the sheep in this enclosure, but... but if they're not guarding the gate and they're not protecting the gate, then either the sheep can get out or anyone can get in. And so the gate 
was the access point. Not, not only to, to, to herd the sheep into, but to guard and protect. And then in the morning when they would come and get their sheep and take them out to pasture to feed them and water them, then they would come out the gate. And the only way for thieves or robbers or anyone who wasn't supposed to be there to get in is they would have to climb in over the wall because they couldn't get through the gate. And if they did somehow get over the wall and get in the pen with the sheep, then the gatekeeper or the shepherd would deal with them and take care of them to provide and protect the sheep. And the only, the, the only way the sheep would leave the enclosure is if their shepherd came in and guided them out and led them out. We're going to talk a lot more about about, about shepherding, what Jesus is talking about there uh, next week. So I hope everybody's super excited to learn so much more about shepherding and, and sheep. But Jesus said, in, in the context of that imagery, he said, I'm the gate. And as the gate, Jesus delivers sinners from bondage. As the gate, Jesus leads people to fulfillment and belonging and freedom. And as the gate, Jesus allows his followers to find security and protection from this life. And he secured salvation for us. He secured salvation for you and salvation for me by giving his life for us on the cross and conquering death and bringing victory to anyone and everyone who would put their faith in him. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said in verse 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there's many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And few find it. Jesus said, I'm the gate to the sheep. I'm the source of protection, and I'm the source of provision in this life. Those who follow me, they'll find life. They'll find freedom. But thieves and robbers, they just come to steal and kill and destroy. But I, I've come that you may have life and have it in abundance. Jesus wants to lead you out of the empty religion. And into a life-giving relationship with him. You don't have to worry about measuring up. You don't have to, to worry about being good enough or, or, or following all the rules or meeting all of the expectations. He wants to give you and I freedom to live under the umbrella of his grace every day of our lives. And once we surrender to him, once you surrender your life to Jesus, you'll find extravagance. You'll find abundant joy and satisfaction that this world can't provide. And you can seek to find fulfillment in many different avenues. But none of them are going to give you the protection and the provision that you're looking for. Religion, rule keeping, is just going to frustrate you. It's just going to discourage you. Because you're going to regularly fail to live up to the standards and the expectations. Recreation, pleasure are only going to temporarily satisfy. And it's not always sustainable. And I believe deep down, even, even the strict fundamentalist Pharisees who were trying so hard to live by the rules and so hard to keep every rule and, and, and align their lives in just the right way so that they could find pleasure in God and God could find pleasure in in them. Deep down, we're all looking to prosper in this life. We're all looking for peace in the next life. And Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the access point to all that we need and all that we desire. Satan is a thief. Satan is is a robber, and he's going to do everything he can to convince you that anything and everything apart from Jesus in this world is going to satisfy you, is going to provide for you, is going to protect you, is going to help you, is going to fulfill you. Anything other than Jesus, Satan says, that's what you need. That's what you should pursue. That's what you should spend your time and your money and your effort and your reputation on. 
But don't fall for the disappointment of what Satan tries to offer you. Jesus won't disappoint you. Jesus won't disappoint you. He'll welcome you into his flock. He'll protect you. He will lead for you. He will lead you and he'll provide what's best for you. He'll show you that it's so much more than rituals and rule following. He'll show you what it's like in an abundant relationship with him. Psalm 23 The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. What a beautiful passage. What a beautiful reminder of who Jesus is. All the way back in the Old Testament. You can try to figure it out on your own. You can try to seek belonging and satisfaction in anyone or anything else. But I want you to remember, and if you've heard me preach funerals and you've heard me talk about Psalm 23, I think I say this every single time. Jesus is the one who knows where the green pastures are. Jesus is the one who knows where the quiet, still waters of provision are. Jesus is the one who will be with you in the darkest valleys of your life. Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is the source of abundance. If our faith is in him, we have nothing to worry about. We're all looking for access. We're all trying to go through different gates to find protection, to find provision in our lives. And it's so discouraging when we try to go through any other gate than through the gate of Jesus Christ to find the protection that we need in this life, to find the provision that we need in this life. Let me be very clear on the eve of a big election. Joe Biden is not the gate for protection and provision. And Donald Trump isn't either. Getting married and seeking fulfillment there isn't the gate for protection and fulfillment in life. Landing your dream job isn't the gate to protection and fulfillment in life. An abundant financial portfolio is not the gate for protection and provision in your life. Making the team, landing the lead role, whatever it is that you're seeking and pursuing and desiring in your life apart from Jesus Christ is not the gate to protection and provision. Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the access point to relationship with Almighty God who for the, before the beginning of time set your life apart for his purpose and for his glory. Put in motion his plan to send his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and for me that we might find protection and provision in him alone. And through Jesus, We can rest in peace. Rest in the peace of his presence and rejoice in the abundance of his provision. Jesus is the gate. Jesus is our access point to God. Go to him. Go through him in every way. And it's there and only there that you will find a life of abundance and amazement. Jesus is the gate for the sheep. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the reminder of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, 
So many of us have walked through so many gates thinking that once we get through that gate or once we could, could break through that door, once we could get access to what's on the other side, that that would bring fulfillment, that that would bring protection, that that would bring provision in our life. And God, maybe it does for a time. Maybe it does for a season. And maybe some of these, some of these things like you know, marriage and good jobs and, and good family and good pursuits in our life and trying to, to live out our talents and our skills and our interests, those are all good things. But none of them are as sustainable as a relationship with you. So, Father, I pray this morning that if anybody in this room, anybody watching online, has never walked through the gate of Jesus Christ and put their faith in you, that today would be the day. Today would be the day that their heart and their life would be changed forever, Lord, that they would would find life and that they would find it in abundance. That they quit letting the things of this world steal and kill and destroy their joy and their hope and their satisfaction. That they would go to the place, that they would go to the person who never disappoints us, who never lets us down, who never fails to provide for us. God, if there's one thing in this life we need to be thankful for, It's that Jesus Christ is our access to you. Access to eternal life and access to abundant life. And may we receive it today. May we live it today. May we rejoice in it today. All for the glory of Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing and we're going to worship. And if you need Jesus, we invite you to respond. You can respond online. You can respond right here in this room or in that back hallway or after the service. We want to give you an opportunity to gain access to Jesus Christ. Maybe you need prayer. You need to come and pray at the altar, pray in your chair. Come and pray with me or with someone else. We want to be here for you. We want you to experience the joy and the power of Jesus, the gate for the sheep, access to life eternal and abundant. Let's stand. Let's sing.